baby. Thank you, Alan. So are you getting inspired? We're yeah. to come up here and throw some words down and you know, freestyle, man, you know? Right, so I, mean, I don't want to put no pressure on you, you know? Like, you know when you went out to get the, the drinks, you were saying, I, I, I guess I misunderstood the sign, but you were like, hey. This evening, all of us here, and all of you out there in uh, world land, in cyberspace, and whatever, we're in for a nice surprise. Visiting back her hometown after a long stint. Well, she moved out. She moved to uh, the Lone Star. No. I mean, if anyone is going to move to another state, why the hell, man? Oh, by the way, I I'm voting for. Uh, Beto O'Rourke. Yeah. He's my man. Ooh, you know what I find funny is that he goes by an American sounding name and he changed his name to Beto because it would appeal to Hispanic Actually, people. no. And then Ted Cruz did the exact opposite. Actually, and Beto, Beto, Beto has been known as Beto since he was a kid. Yeah, Beto was known as a kid. Is he really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, no. It, it, it was he, his he, birthday, yeah, he was yeah. always Beto since he was a kid when he was hanging around the Mexican neighborhood. So he, he never changed his name. So that story came out of the 45ers. As, Oh, 45 percent? You know. Yeah. Came out of Ted Cruz. Came out of Ted Cruz's butt, man. You know? <laughs> no, no I, I, I got a chance to meet him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, um, Tim Totten and others, uh, he's the owner of the, of the hideout, and others invited him to come up and, you know, for a fundraiser, and I was uh, lucky enough to have uh, $5,000 just laying on, you know, on my couch. And, I said, hey, you know, I got nothing to do with this cash, so I'm just going to donate it, you know, and go to this fundraiser, and that's my story. <laughs> anyway, but I, got, I, I, went over to, I went over to this fundraiser, it was Shishi Fundraiser. It was on Lakeshore, you know, up there with the high rise and the furniture, it, it said, do not touch children, Mexicans and others, do not touch. <laughs> was it in Spanish? L luckily, I'm white. <laughs> white. I'm like, hey, shit. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man, I can do this shit. <laughs> white Mexicans. <laughs> and I had to talk to him, but you know who I, I honestly, I was talking to him for a briefly three or five minutes you know, in this little crowd, but you know, the conversation. He reminded me of Bobby Kennedy. It just blew me away. He, he reminded me of Bobby Kennedy, of like, listen, tall, handsome, with a little drawl of his, you know, talking from the heart, and all of that, I said, yeah, Bobby Kennedy is in the house, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Anyways, so our next part, ladies and gentlemen, she decides to go to Texas, following the love of her life, which is okay, you know, mistakes are made, but it's... <laughs> Everybody <makes it. laughs> I understand, you know, I understand. <laughs> but she's uh, back home visiting family and friends and decided to come and visit our little joint, hey. ladies and gentlemen. She has published, she's done, I mean, her accolades are abundant, none of which I'm going to remember nor care to spew. <laughs> but let's give it up and give her a nice warm hand. <laughs> Janet Kuyper, put you guys together. <laughs> I do not. Okay. I'll just keep going out and grabbing books. He, he said things about publishers. Um, the gentleman that was just up here was thanking me because I had published him in one of one or two of my literary magazines. I run two magazines at Scarce Publications, CCND Magazine and Down the Dirt Magazine. If you want to know anything about them, why remember the web address, scars, S-C-A-R-S dot TV. And you can find out about them. And you can submit poetry to me from any of those magazine addresses. I made a point from publishing with Scars Publications to release a few books just in time for my coming here. So I'd like to share from you a poem from each book. The first right, book. Right. The, thank you. This, and they're all for sale. Uh, 
yeah, I love this first one. It was $10. Um, this one is actually based on a suggestion from someone else to take selections of interviews and journals along with select poems throughout the years of my life. And it is called In Depth, which is why I've got this really spooky looking picture of me on the cover. <laughs> with silver all over my yeah. face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it starts with an interview from 1990 and then poetry through a, a current stuff from an interview from this past year, um, two of them actually. So I'm going to share with you one poem from this book and it was written in Austin, uh, Austin, <laughs> Texas, where someone who had been here once before ran a, a feature space at the Baha'i Faith Center and this was on a show about Peace poetry, and so I would like to share with you the first poem, Protecting Peace Can Put You in Prison. The first Nobel Peace Prize was granted in 1901. The first Nobel Peace Prize laureate to die in prison was Karl von Ossietzky, detained by Nazi Germany. He died in prison in 1938. But there's a new death, so do not fret because you can. Oh, it, death can uh, death can always happen to people for peace in any millennium. Do you remember the Tiananmen Square riots back in 1989, or, or at least that photo of that one student standing in front of a tank? Well, the students didn't do this, all this, and, and win against the Chinese government on their own. They had help. And this, I've got to find this button. They had help from Lu Xiaobo. This man for peace was revered for, for his work, but the Chinese government stopped him in 2008 because he was defining and drafting to, promo, uh, to draft and promote a peaceful coexistence for manifesto. And for this, the Chinese government imprisoned him for subversion. <laughs> yes, for subversion. This man was sentenced to 11 years in prison, and it was while he was in prison that he was granted a Nobel Peace Prize. During the Oslo Awards ceremony, they even left an empty chair for their imprisoned man of honor. <sighs> However, now the Chinese government now has to bear a responsibility for more than for just imprisoning a Nobel Peace Laureate who only promoted peaceful politics, but now their failure to properly diagnose and treat his ailments. Because on July 13th, 2017, the imprisoned Nobel Peace Prize winner died while in prison and detained for liver cancer. And you see, we can look around the room and think that we are nice to people and that we respect other people. And when we look around the room, we can think that other people feel the same way. And it's wonderful to surround yourself with people who are like you, who think like you, who cushion you from anyone who may possibly think differently. Because when you stay in your bubble, everything seems safe. But it's only when we see and choose to actually fight, when we see these people who fight, who choose to, be, to promote peace and are trounced upon, and our downtrodden, only then do we see why supporting a peaceful coexistence <laughs> means that sometimes staying with supporters is seldom the actual solution. Peace with the ones you know is one thing. Peace with a mortal enemy is another. When others <laughs> decide that you are at fault for some unknown reason. So maybe the key to promoting peace is not to share your ideas with those like-minded souls you're near, but to find people least like you, religiously, racially, politically, and just extend your hand in peace, and then see who will take your hand. as well, but you'd have to pay shipping and handling. You can just get this from me for 10 bucks right now. Anyway, <laughs> the other two books I'm going to read for, for you are collections of performance art poetry over the years, and they are in Chicago, and they were on a chapter 18, 20, 30, 40, this eight series, and they are chapter 48, volume one, 
Donna Dunn, which is the coolest skyline of Chicago ever. And chapter 48, volume two. And this is why I've got one of it flying away because some of the shows are actually in Austin as well. And so I'm going to start with a poem from chapter 48, volume two. However, I'm not gonna read it from this one because the poem I'm gonna read from you is also one I'm doing in a show in two days. I've got two features. I've got two features. One tomorrow at the Poetry Open Mic. I used to run a gallery cabaret to my dream with Berkeley from 7 to 9 p.m. And one at, the other one is on Wednesday, starting at 10.30 with the Open Mic at In One Year, In One Ear, at the Heartland Cafe area. And I'm going to read a poem from that show for you. And because I placed them all out big tight for my show, I'm going to read from that. But this is from Chapter 48. Welcome to, just want to share that with you. And this is from my last show that I ever had at let them eat chocolate. Anyway, and it is called Other Souls. <sighs> Other Souls litter history books. I wish I was June of Arc, carrying her banner in battle, giving divinely inspired advice to men under her command. <sighs> and I wish I was burned at the stake for my beliefs. As the flames rose to her Roman nose, I wonder if she ever knew of her ultimate power. I wish I was on the Titanic. <laughs> that sounds just like me, like to be one of the rich elite on the first cruise across the ocean. But, but, but I wish I'd gone down, gone down with them. I don't care what passenger I am. The, the point is that people will study this disaster, and, and I was in for like centuries. Books will be written, movies will be box office hits, all for me being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I wish I were my ancestors, Marie, Avshi, Petronella, Johanna. I wish I was in the resistance like them to save Jews from the SS in World War II. Uh, I never lived through their struggles, but I'd gladly take their place and fight for something, even if it means being killed by the Nazis. For what? For trying to save lives. I wish I was on flight 175, just on another one of my trips across the country. I'm getting used to airplanes. It's actually a quite a nice ride this morning, and there's you know, those clouds in the sky. Come to by 2001, comes out the damage I had seen by that time in my life. Maybe this would be a good way to go. I haven't seen the World Trade Tower since 1995. Wow, what a view this flight is giving me. Maybe I'd hear from a neighboring passenger's phone call about the hijackers. No matter. I'd see the inferno in the North Tower before I'd take a part in a big inferno myself. Some time to panic, but then, like that, it's over. Years later, my name would be cut through metal, memorialized around the fountains with fountains in the once fallen towers. Yeah, it'd be quick, for, but people would come to the New York intersection by, by appointment only and run their hands along the letters of my name. After all this pain, they wouldn't forget. Other souls litter history books. Some may have been great. Some, as I said, may have been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And after I've been attacked, after what I've been through, after I've been almost killed, what? I, I, I've, I've pieced myself, my life back together. I, I've screamed my stories from rooftops. I've etched my words into stone. And no one hears me. And if they do, no one will remember. Shows and these, even though these are huge, this is only twelve dollars in my hand. Twelve dollars, count them one, two. What a bargain! <laughs> and the last one I'm going to read from you is from chapter forty-eight, volume one. It is from older readings, and I hope this is a good way to end it for you guys. This poem is called "I'm Not Sick, But I'm Not Well." I'm not sick, but I'm not 
well. And I'm sure there's something I can do about this. I pop the aspirin, the Tylenol, the ibuprofen, the codeine, the Prozac, the sleeping pills, and that thermometer is down my throat and I'm gagging. I'm not sick, but I'm not well. Uh, the doctors can find nothing wrong with me, and believe me, they take the x-rays and they've stripped me down and they've made me wear one of those god-awful paper robes and they've felt me up and they've checked me out and they found what they were looking for, but they never found what I was looking for. <laughs> I'm not sick, but I'm not well, and I can't help but think that everything that I'm doing to make things better might only be making things worse. So, I don't want to listen to what you have to say anymore, and I want this IV out of my arm, and I want this oxygen tube out of my nose, and I want this suppository out of my ass, and I want you to get that scalpel away from me, because I want everything I've got. I'm not sick, but I'm not well. And they want me if they can keep me in line. And they want me if they can cut me open and take out my insides and suck out the fat and suck out the life and make me generic and make me dependent and make me unreal and make me not whole. And I've walked that line with all of you doctors. And I want all of my parts back. And I want to be healthy. <sighs> no, I'm not sick. But maybe I'm not well. But you're only making me worse. So, I don't have the answers, but neither do you. So, so instead of tearing me apart and dissecting me and studying the bones, let me just stay together for a while until I figure it all out. All right. Thank you. And for an extra dollar, she'll sign it for you. <laughs> that poem described my aunt to a T. The woman was a hypochondriac since the moment she was born.